So welcome to the, uh, oh, no, I'm really mic'd. And welcome to the second day of uh, the room where it happens on the, on the Agency of Interior Spaces Symposium. Uh, I am, my name is Laura Igo. Um, I was the 2016 to 2017 Mayor Curatorial Fellow of American Art here at Harvard Art Museums, and I'm currently an instructor at Temple University in Philadelphia. Uh, our program today features nine papers on diverse rooms and spaces, uh, arranged into three panels. Rooms for looking, rooms for making, and virtual rooms. And the day will conclude with a talk by the artist Mark Dion. Bios for all of the speakers can be found in your program, and there will be time for a Q&A and discussion at the end of each panel. It is my great pleasure uh, to introduce the first panel today, Rooms for Looking. Last night in his fascinating keynote lecture on William Blathwaite's Curated Rooms of Empire, Lewis Nelson proposed that rooms matter because they collect things that allow us to see networks and relationships. The papers in our first panel explore the unexpected human relationships with the objects and architecture of a dis uh, distinct group of interior spaces. These are rooms for looking, but they are also rooms that shape their viewing experiences. So our first presenter today uh, is Jennifer Van Horn, Assistant Professor of Art History and History at the University of Delaware. And her paper is entitled, No One Could Prevent Us From Making Good Use of Our Eyes, Enslaved Spectators in Southern Plantation Spaces. Our second speaker is Julia Rosenbaum, Associate Professor and Chair of Art History at Bard College and Director of Research and Publications at the Olana Partnership and Olana State Historic Site. Her, body, her uh, paper is entitled, The Room of Broken Bodies, Civil War Wounds, the Army Medical Museum, and Perceiving Reunification. And our final speaker is Boris Oikerman, Oik excuse me, uh, Cindy and Jay Illenfeld, uh, Curator of Creative Collaborations at the Weissman Art Museum uh, at the University of Minnesota. And his paper is entitled, The Symposium on Habitability, Robert Irwin, NASA, and the Case of the Artist as a Meta Scholar. So without further ado, Jennifer Van Horn. Um, so like most of the speakers today, I assume I'm, I'm very happy to thank both Laura and Ethan for including me in this. Um, and I'm excited for a wonderful day of papers and conversation. In June 1937, members of the Federal Writers' Slave Project interviewed and photographed Daphne Williams of Beaumont, Texas. Williams, they estimated, was then close to or over 100. Born a slave near Tallahassee, Florida, she was moved to Texas by her owners, the Herring family, before the outbreak of the Civil War. Among her strongest memories were the family portraits inside their plantation house. As she described, and I'll paraphrase, they had themselves painted in pictures on the wall just as big as they were. They had them in big frames like gold. Ironically, the full-length paintings of the Herring family Williams gazed upon as an enslaved girl are lost, whereas two photographs of Williams have survived as part of a government archive. Williams' observations about looking at her owner's portraits, however, force us to confront these missing paintings not through the eyes of the work's white makers, patrons, or sitters, as we usually think about such objects, but rather through the eyes of the men and women enslaved by the portrait subjects who also gazed upon these images. Questioned many years after emancipation, some former Bond people, like Williams, vividly remembered the canvases displayed in planters' parlors. Their words are evidence of the enslaved viewership that happened at plantations across the 18th and 19th century South. As one freedwoman recalled, quote, no one could prevent us making good use of our eyes. Enslaved nurses, waiters, butlers, and housemaids, all of whom labored and often slept in planters' houses, had ample opportunity to gaze at the artworks on parlor's walls. As in Williams's case, the vast majority of the images enslaved viewers encountered were portraits, painted depictions of planters, their wives, children, or ancestors, arranged programmatically to establish family lineage, and to assert a racialized hegemony of likeness. Whites had access to portraiture, blacks overwhelmingly did not. We often think about plantations as spaces designed to produce a staple crop, but they were also organized to produce aesthetic responses. The many 18th century portraits of the Randolph family assembled in the entry hall and parlor at Wilton Plantation, outside of Richmond, Virginia, offer a paradigmatic example. 
For white plantation owners, including the Randolphs, canvases like these held tremendous cultural value as proof of planters' longstanding claims to southern land and enslaved labor, as well as their centuries-old pursuit of an aristocratic lifestyle. The meaning that these paintings held for enslaved viewers is harder to recover. So this paper necessarily then draws together fragmentary evidence from various parts of the antebellum South to uncover the ways that viewership created a temporary space for enslaved people to assert their independence of thought and to claim aesthetic agency in the face of planters' assertions of their objecthood. Critical to my analysis is the iconoclasm African Americans committed against planters' portraits during the Civil War. Across the South, hundreds of enslaved people took the opportunity afforded by their master's absences to usurp planters' visual and material possessions. Their actions illuminate hidden strategies of resistance and submerge negative affects that together had shaped enslaved people's aesthetic engagement with parlors and their contents. So we'd like to begin with um, a very unique and the most complete account of an enslaved spectator's experience. Uh, and that survives in a semi-autobiographical novel, The Bondswoman's Narrative by Hannah Crafts, uh, discovered by Henry Louis Gates, um, who attributed it to Hannah Bonds, uh, written during her enslavement in North Carolina in the 1850s. When the fictional narrator, an enslaved housemaid, first encountered her master's artworks, she saw merely, quote, the long succession of family portraits ranged against the walls in order of age and ancestral dignity. In only a moment, however, Crafts altered the collection and made depictions of slave owners accommodate to an enslaved woman's narrative. As the shadows shifted, quote, movement came over the line of stolid faces. A veteran in the old time wars assumes a gracious expression it never wore in life, and the frozen cheek of an ancient dame seems beguiled into smiles. Hannah Crafts reads these portraits as she wishes, rather than as the artist or sitter intended forming dimples in an old woman's cheeks and reducing a veteran's sternness. This overlay of new characters and events, or what one former slave described as, quote, making a story of immediate interest to my mind from a picture, allowed enslaved spectators to overturn the hierarchy whites established. In his autobiography, Frederick Douglass described the pleasure enslaved viewers experienced when they engaged in such acts of creative spectatorship. The young Douglas surveyed the mansion and artworks of planter Edward Lloyd V, uh, the most prominent of which was this painting of Lloyd's ancestors by Charles Wilson Peale. Recalling the great house at Lloyd's Maryland plantation with, quote, all its pictures within and pillars without, Douglas wrote, quote, they occupied it, I enjoyed it. In his use of the word enjoy, Douglas encompassed both his sense of delight upon contemplating Y House and its contents, as well as the potential for a kind of possession that came with his gaze. Such visual possession engendered a palpable sense of freedom, an awareness of ownership of self. As the fictional crafts articulated, quote, I was not a slave with these pictured memorials of the past. They could not condemn me to a life of servitude. As their companion, I could think and speculate. For this short period of time, the span of a glance, an enslaved woman was able to look back, and like Douglas, she relished in this power, quote, exulting in her freedom as a rational being. To call this social practice of looking an act of resistance might at first be jarring. We often think of enslaved resistance as constituting open defiance, exemplified by running away to freedom, a scenario valorized in popular images such as this one from an abolitionist children's magazine. Yet as bond people who ran away were deemed to have stolen themselves, and others stole away to the woods to temporarily escape the planter's gaze, so too did enslaved people who stole a glance at paintings assert their own personhood or distance from being commodities themselves. Enslaved spectators who gazed upon works of art had an aesthetic reaction beyond slaveholders' control, and one which bond people deemed, in the religiously infused language of the day, a means to restore their souls. As Hannah Bonds and Frederick Douglass suggested, Planter's artworks offered personal pleasure and aesthetic agency to those whose time, labor, and bodies were appropriated from them. To be sure, these stolen glances in plantation parlors constituted a very circumscribed type of resistance dependent upon location and concealment. Whereas Bond people who ran away risked being caught and punished, those who looked at paintings relied upon their approved physical presence in the parlor dusting for protection. 
Subversive viewership was clandestine, a kind of mental and visual truancy that could happen underneath the master's <coughs> nose. However, when given the opportunity during the Civil War, many former slaves physically enacted their creative readings and suppressed desires on planters' artworks, fixing their previously ephemeral engagement in material forms. In the midst of the Union Army's bombardment of Charleston, South Carolina in 1863, an unidentified Bond person removed this 18th century portrait of the young Daniel Ward, his or her master's ancestor, from the walls of the McGillivray <coughs> parlor, then covered the canvas with newspaper and repurposed the painting as a fire screen in his or her own dwelling. In its altered format, the painting, now a rectangular screen mounted on a pole, may have resembled earlier fire screens used by members of the southern gentry to shield themselves from a fire's heat, though it likely consisted of a much more rudimentary apparatus. The historic portrait of an elite white southern boy accordingly became a piece of furniture that protected a seated black user from the flames. Meanwhile, not far away at Silk Hope Plantation, formerly enslaved people, quote, disfigured and mutilated portraits owned by planter Charles Izzard Manigo. To Manigo's horror, newly freed African Americans snatched these depictions of his ancestors from crates and, quote, scratched, tore, and defaced them. Conservation photographs in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, taken in the 1920s, confirmed that the painting suffered damage that was concentrated on the represented faces. In Gabriel Manigo's portrait, the eyes had been scratched, the left almost entirely obliterated, and the canvas slashed from the top of Manigo's head straight down to his throat. In the depiction of Anne Ashby Manigo, a scratch runs across the figure's nose between her eyes, and paint has been removed from her nostrils. Circular holes in the top center of both canvases, I mean right here, um, may well be nail holes hammered by formerly enslaved people when they, quote, nailed up the paintings in their own huts, as Manigo disdainfully described. By disfiguring portraits of their master's ancestors, scratching painted faces, and obscuring figures behind newsprint, enslaved people erased or overwrote the portrait's intended messages of white dominance. Such themes are particularly evident in John Wollaston's portrait of Daniel Ward. The painting might have been chosen as a fire screen for its convenient dimensions, but also likely because of its laden iconography, the black dog with its strangely human eye, surrounded not by black fur, but a ring of pale pink skin. Perhaps an enslaved viewer recognized in the dutiful and subservient dark canine a metonym for his or her own enforced devotion. Other artists also employed this metaphor most famously, Justice Inglehart Kuhn in his portrait of young Marylander Henry Darnell III and an enslaved attendant <coughs> who wears a conspicuous silver collar. The latter acts as a hunting dog that retrieves his master's prey, whereas in Ward's painting, the black attendant seems to have become that beast himself. The alterations to Daniel Ward's painting illuminate another facet of enslaved viewership, anger and violence. Whereas written whereas written descriptions stress spectatorship as a means of spiritual restitution, altered paintings glimpse, um, allows a glimpse of retaliation against former masters for suffering endured. The decision to turn a painting into an artifact used near a fire is significant. South Carolina legally mandated severe punishments for slaves, including burning enslaved men and women alive for rebellious crimes, such as murdering whites, uh, and several African Americans were executed by fire in the 19th century. More commonly, planters used fire as a weapon against freedom by branding a bond person's cheeks or arms as a sign of ownership or as punishment for running away. Whereas cabinet making manuals like this one instructed that a fire screen should, quote, shelter the user's face or legs from the fire, a freedman or woman may have envisioned his or her former master's depiction and by extension his body instead being left to roast over the fire's heat. The user and any other visitor who shared in the fire's warmth likely knew that proximity to the flames would discolor the painting, covered or not, and that the young white Daniel Ward was slowly blackening while the fire screen's user sat safely protected. Uh, and I would just say briefly, this act recalls African cultural and religious practices uh, in which fire and binding or covering uh, were supposed to activate an object's latent power. Uh, for purposes of retribution. Um, and this is knowledge likely held by enslaved people in South Carolina uh, who were noted to retain African spiritual traditions. <clears throat>
This unidentified iconoclast's need for vengeance illuminates the double-sided nature of plantation interiors. For enslaved workers, parlors were not places of comfort, but all too often locations where violence and heart-wrenching grief coalesced to impact the ways that enslaved people located emotions in their master's artworks. The reminiscences of a former slave identified only as Mr. Reed from Tennessee give a sense of how visual and material culture could structure negative affect. Reed recalled, quote, the most barbarous thing I saw with these eyes, which happened after his older sister, quote, was fooling with the master's clock and broke it. Reed's owner, quote, tied her up in the backyard and whipped her. I don't know how long. There stood mother, father, and all the children. None could come to her rescue. For Reed and his family, the master's parlor with its ticking clock engendered shame and sparked anger. Years later, the scene continued to haunt him. Reed's story reminds us that his master's portraits and their goods, even objects as ordinary as a clock, produced emotions in enslaved people, both during slavery and after freedom, and those feelings were often profoundly powerful. Iconoclasm offered the possibility for emotional release. Within slavery, enslaved spectators could only imagine such physical alterations. Frederick Douglass referred to his soul as a, quote, picture gallery, a parlor filled with modified images where slaves found temporary refuge. Daphne Williams's recollections suggest both the power of enslaved spectators' imaginations and the limitations of their effervescent alterations to the plantation interior. Williams related how her master's life-size portraits were surrounded by, and I'll paraphrase here again, big mirrors that stretched from the floor to the ceiling, noting you could see yourself walk in them. As Williams viewed her reflection in pier glasses that might have resembled this one, she saw herself standing at the same scale beside the full-size depictions of the planter's family whose children she minded. Through her gaze, Williams added her own portrait to the parlor's walls and gained agency. She could see herself walking. Williams' experience highlights the paradox of her resistance. Viewership offered the chance to temporarily move out of her status as property, but the assertion of her subjectivity emerged only from her subjection. She could see her fleeting reflection in the mirror, but not fix it on canvas. After freedom, imaginary picture galleries of the soul briefly gained material presence. When freedmen and women exhibited portraits turned fire screens or displayed mutilated depictions in their own dwellings, they dramatically restaged an alternative visual universe. Metaphorically present, but unable to see out, the representations of white slaveholders, like the absent master himself, could no longer control African Americans' labor or their vision. Yet such alterations were short-lived. By the early 20th century, white elites repossessed the artworks of African Americans had claimed during the war, and after having them conserved, they placed these paintings once again in their parlors. Wiped clean of African Americans' iconoclasm, along with peeling newsprint and darkened varnish, portraits like Daniel Ward's became available for white Southerners to attach a new but familiar story of a lost chivalrous past. Thank you. Um, I'm going to add my voice of thanks as well um, for this opportunity today. Can, can, is this better? Yeah, I think so. Um, I also quickly want to say that in a very strange twist, I find uh, life imitating art. My new research project uh, focuses on the representation of damaged bodies. And out of the blue, a couple of days ago, I was stricken with Bell's palsy. So the left side of my face is temporarily paralyzed, just so you know. In any case, my new Picasso-esque form is, I hope, less eerie than the subject I am about to share with you. <laughs> this paper is about a collection of bones, specifically the collection of Union so soldiers' bones on display at the United States Government Army Medical Museum, established in the summer of 1862. As an early visitor to the museum reflected, 
It is indeed not such a collection as the timid would care to visit at midnight and alone. <laughs> Fancy the pale moonlight lighting up with a blackish tinge, the blanched skeletons and grinning skulls, the same moon that saw in many a case the death blow given or the bullet pierce. Only in the bright, day, bright light of day did such ghostly evocations of Civil War battlefields give way for the visitor to thoughtful in inspection and calm curiosity. Then and still today, the Army Medical Museum uh, bones are uncanny specimens. They both haunt the imagination and attempt to tame it. I want to explore here their grip. The museum, during and immediately after the war, exerted a peculiar power that went beyond the stated pursuit of mere medical knowledge. The museum's very creation generated, indeed, a political counter-narrative to the horror of national dissolution the war signaled and the trauma of physical devastation soldiers' bone fragments exposed. The war that pitted Americans from northern and southern states against each other commenced in 1861. About a year later, in May of 1862, the Surgeon General's office issued a directive. Medical officers of the Union Army were to collect all specimens of morbid anatomy from on and off the battlefields. The specimens were to be gathered together into a museum setting, and in August 1862, the Surgeon General um, appointed a curator to both collect and arrange the material. There was a lot of material. New military technologies, such as the Minet ball, shattered bone and flesh, wounded in death tolls, soared. The destruction of the male body seized the attention of not just the, attorney, uh, the Surgeon General's office, but Union citizens in general, among them famed American poet and author Walt Whitman, who spent the war in military hospitals nursing soldiers. In his book, Memoranda During the War, the very first entry summons body parts. Speaking of one of the Virginia camp hospitals, he writes, outdoors at the foot of a tree within 10 yards of the front of the house, I notice a heap of amputated feet, legs, arms, hands, etc. a full load for a one horse cart. In the introduction, Whitman had insisted that the marrow of the tragedy concentrated in those hospitals. It seemed sometimes as if the whole interest of the land, north and south, was one vast central hospital and all the rest of the affair but flanges. For Whitman and the Army Medical Museum, the fragmented body dominates. The poet's attempt to articulate the ordeal of disunion resonates with the government's endeavor to bring together the shattered pieces of its troops. Whitman described in structured memoranda as a compilation of entries transcribed from his penciled bits hastily scratched down throughout the war. This narrative strategy functioned to convey a sense of immediacy, a witnessing or testimony, as well as an acknowledgement that at a fundamental level, the carnage of the war would never and could never be fully apprehended. The fragment uh, captured it all precisely because it embodied this partial visibility. For Surgeon General William Hammond, fragments could be made to yield larger truths. Ostensibly, Hammond set up the Army Medical Museum as a scientific project to better heal wounded bodies then and for the future. The specimens of Civil War morbid anatomy served to document specific medical events and conditions. A key goal was to pro provide the raw material for a surgical history, which indeed was published after the war by the US government printing office in six massive volumes detailing thousands of cases entitled The Medical and Surgical History of the War of the Rebellion. But during the war, medical practice and learning took place experientially at the camp hospitals as surgeons and medical personnel endeavored to save limbs and lives. Surgeons in the field were responsible for sending specimens to the Army Medical Museum with required explanatory notes, 
That is personal information, such as name, regiment, injury, and the soldier whose body part had been collected. Military officers, on occasion, donated amputated limbs. This was the case with the colorful Major General Daniel E. Sickles, pictured here. He packed up his amputated limb after, or his leg, his, his amputated leg, after the Battle of Gettysburg and forwarded it on to the Army Medical Museum. The accompanying note read, with the compliments of Major General D.E.S. And here he is at the medical, uh, Army Medical Museum looking at his actual bone fragment. By the end of the war, the Army Medical Museum had embarked on a major campaign of, his, of its own, drawing, engraving, and photographing individual body parts, as well as surviving soldiers with missing limbs or unusual wounds. Along with preparing the medical and surgical history volumes, the museum began publication of a massive photographic project that featured surviving soldiers with their amputated limbs bared for the camera. I'm not going to show you one of those. Uh, but I will show you this. Uh, it also began a concerted effort to display its collection to the public. In 1866, through an act of Congress, the federal government purchased a new location for the museum, Ford's Theater, the site of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. And this is uh, an image pre-renovation before the uh, museum moved in. The symbolic charge of the space was noted early on. In an article on the museum, an article on the museum in Lippincott's magazine concluded with the sentence, what nobler monument could the nation erect to his, that is Lincoln's memory, than this somber treasure house devoted to the study of disease and injury, mutilation and death? With the move to Ford's theater in the heart of the nation's capital, the museum enshrined both Lincoln's commitment to the concept of national unity, the United States, and the price for that commitment, the physical bodies of individual citizens. The Army Medical Museum's scientific work for the advancement of military medicine had from the outset been a project of recuperation. Its new location fixed it as a sacred space its exhibition hall, a, a, um, a holy reliquary. Not just medical professionals, but veterans and the public at large made efforts to visit. In his memoir, the museum's first curator touched on the potency of the site. I'm, qu it's, I'm quoting. As soon as the museum was fairly established in its new home, it began to attract attention. The public came to see the bones, attracted by a new sensation. Then too, it often happened that officers and soldiers who had lost a limb by amputation would come to look up its resting place, in some sense, its last resting place. The curator recalled a moment when an officer with his daughter came in looking for a leg bone, happily finding it and noticing how nicely fixed up it was. Major General Sickles, who you've been seeing a lot of, was said to have visited his leg at the museum every year at the anniversary of its amputation. During the presidential inauguration of Ulysses Grant in March 1869, the press of visitors was so great, the museum sought to extend its hours, and visitor logbooks show a significant spike that month. The third floor of, the Ford, of Ford's theater housed the museum. Visitors ascended a large air, uh, iron staircase, according to a published account, which also describes framed sketches and plans of Gettysburg, Antietam, and other major battlefields lining the walls of the stairwell. The ascent created a kind of processional that moved the viewer from entryway to center, from first to third floor, from the everyday to the extraordinary, from the war on the ground to the war on the body, from the collective fight to individual sacrifice. Once at the destination, the hall's numerous glass cases in neat rows, the tidy and sterile presentation of specimens asserted a sense of order and a disciplining of bodily mutilation and pain into a worthy cause, the advance of science and medicine for humanity. When a major newspaper first announced the creation of the Army Medical Museum, it pushed hard on this theme. The article opened, quote, 
among the thoughts in which a humane man can indulge without pain in the midst of the chaotic confusion of the rebellion is the reflection that the busy hands and thoughtful mind of science, now as in other wars, are quietly at work, endeavoring to wring good for mankind even out of this evil and to pluck from the very barbarism of war new fruits for civilization. The sharp juxtaposition of the humane and the thoughtful action against the chaotic confusion, the evil and the barbarism, makes sense in the context of the second year of a war that clearly was brutal and not ending quickly. But I would suggest these words had a more specific target, a profound concern about union sacrifice and male bodies. Reports had started to circulate in spring 1862 about horrors in Virginia post-battle, specifically the, de the desecration of bodies. Confederate soldiers were said to have been mutilating corpses for trophy taking, dysentering dead Union soldiers to cut off heads or remove bones and body parts to have as war relics. In one instance, Witnesses told of rebel soldiers making finger rings out of Union soldiers' leg bones. How extensive these practices were is unclear, but it provoked widespread Northern alarm. In April of 1862, the US Congress began collecting testimony on what it called rebel barbarities that were subsequently printed up. Two satirical con cartoons came out around the same time in major northern magazines and speak to the depth of public anxieties. Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper ran one in May entitled The, Rebels Lady, the Rebel Lady's Boudoir, which is at the bottom, which I'll show you in more detail. Harper's Weekly published another the following month at the top called Some Specimens of Secesh Industry. In this one, and here you have, I'm afraid, a graphic close-up, Laid out in two neat rows, as though from a catalog, are an assortment of gruesome artifacts that reveal a macabre secessionist enterprise. Union soldiers' bones have been turned into domestic items, kitchenware, jewelry, clothing. The other, the rebel lady's boudoir, underscores the barbarity of not just Confederate soldiers, but Southern life in general. An extended caption ex cites the congressional testimony about Confederates' use of Union bones. The visual grimly echoes the textual. A rebel lady, engrossed in a letter, comfortably enjoys tea served from vessels made out of northern skulls, which you can see on the table next to her. Even grosser is the second part of the caption uh, that relates the specific content of the letter she holds. My dearest wife, I hope you have received all the little relics I have sent you from time to time. I'm about to add something to your collection, which I feel sure will please you. A baby rattle for our little pet, pictured on the floor, made out of the ribs of a Yankee drummer boy. Both cartoons, and the second one most explicitly, domesticate male bones, turning them into feminine adornments. The cartoon presents union masculinity as assaulted on two fronts. First, the violence of disinterment and improper funerary rites. And second, the demeaning transformation of the active male subject into the passive decorative object of the female realm. America's civil war, as represented in these two cartoons, hasn't just torn the country apart, it has put in peril standards of masculine behavior and action. How then might we return to the Army Medical Museum? Mid-1862 marks the overlap of these atrocity reports with the Surgeon General's founding of the museum. Whether consciously or not, the call to collect Union soldiers' remains stands out as an urgent reordering effort. I see this played out at multiple levels. First, the Army Medical Museum's gathering of Union soldiers' bones set rational northern scientific inquiry over and against perceived southern barbarity and irrational vengeance. Second, 
As a center for the study of science and medicine, the museum's gathering of bones worked both to bestow symbolic di dignity to Union soldiers' death and reclaim safe internments. At a third level, the collections proclaimed Union masculinity by asserting bodily sacrifice as an emblem of heroic male action and bravery. And finally, as a federal institution, the Army Medical Museum and its scientific museum offered a transcendent vision for the United States as a civilizing agent, a country imagined as ultimately able, in the words of the new newspaper article, to pluck from the very barbarism of war new fruits for civilization. The Army Medical Mu Museum Hall made material the abstract purpose of national redemption. Through the room, the museum gathered the bones of its sacrificed citizens in a ritualistic act of remembering. The power of this remembering is voiced in a piece of fiction that came out right after the war in a leading magazine. The story focuses on a Union soldier who has lost an arm and his legs in battle. As he recovers, he becomes increasingly and mournfully aware of his fractured self. And this is where the story becomes not only eerie, but directly related to the museum's symbolic mission. He agrees to go to a seance, and there he has a vision of wholeness. Through the medium in the room, he is contacted by the spirit of his amputated legs, the physical bones of which reside at none other than the Army Medical Museum, as specimen numbers 3486 and 3487. Marveling at this fictive reunion, he relates how, quote, a strange wonder filled me, and, in the and to the amazement of everyone, I arose, and staggering a little, walked across the room on limbs invisible to them or me. As this dramatic visitation captures, the Army Medical Museum's room of broken bodies held the dream of reunification. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So thank you very much for being here and for inviting me. And thank you also goes to Larry Bell, who permitted me to use the materials from his archive in this presentation. So I first want to set the context and um, say explicitly what do I mean by Metascholar, in, in my talk at least, um, and give this quote that was written 40 years after the events I'm going to talk about. It's by Pablo Hulguera, who is the education director of MoMA, from uh, the book about socially engaged art. Socially engaged art functions by attaching itself to subjects and problems that normally belong to other disciplines, moving them temporarily into a space of ambiguity. It is this temporary snatching way of subjects into the realm of art making that brings new insight to particular problems and conditions, and in turn makes them visible to other disciplines. So when I talk about meta-scholars, I talk about this particular quality of being able to engage with a range of disciplines, but not in order to excel in them, but in order to disturb them. 
So you've had some of the experience of Larry Bell who showed this movie while being almost deaf. Uh, he called himself the silent participant in the symposium. And this is his friend, Robert Irvin. And the room where that all happened is his studio in Venice, LA in 71. This is the same guy um, with his masterpiece that won a military context, uh, contest. Uh, so he gets back from after the Korean War, he gets back to LA, uh, bounces around LA art scene, goes to several art, two or three art schools, doesn't finish any one of them, and eventually gets to be an abstract expressionist painter because this is what most of the painters did at the time without having any particular reason for that. But pretty soon he starts asking questions and develops uh, perhaps one of the most iconic cases of artistic research in the 20th century. Um, he starts questioning the image. How do I paint a painting without an image? How do I paint a painting that doesn't resemble anything to anyone? He figures, okay, probably a line will not look like anything to anyone. Paints lines for many years, and then realizes, okay, line is actually an image of a line, and any mark will be an image of itself. So how do I paint a painting that doesn't have any mark and still has the visual energy? So he covers a huge canvas with millions of red and green dots that get your visual system crazy. And then from the viewing distance, that whole square canvas actually vibrates. And then he asks, OK, and why is that canvas actually square? What primes me as a painter to have frames in my paintings? Uh, can I question that? And this was his way of questioning that. He wanted to create a painting that doesn't have edges at all. And that ends up being um, convex, concave, sorry, um, translucent painted surface that he illuminated in a very special and uniform way. So it completely blended with the wall that it hangs on. And this is where things start breaking down for him completely because he had to go to a lot of galleries and museums and he installed the lighting himself. So complicated it was. And while doing that, he realized that he was probably working for the last decade on the false pretense that his paintings have some sort of an intrinsic value to them that travels with them from place to place. And that last painting actually just broke that physically. And his realization led him, within a scope of several years, to quit the studio work altogether because he realized, okay, why make things in a studio at all if I cannot move them out and have them preserve the meaning? So before that, while he was working on the, on the discs, he gets contacted by the curator, um, Maurice Stuchman, curator of LACMA, who was working on art and technology project of Los Angeles County Museum, as it's called. And that project was supposed to put a lot of artists of the time to work in corporations and research studios and use these corporations as, sorry, research labs, and use these corporations as studios. And Robert Irvin was already on the way out of the studio, like physically and conceptually, so he wasn't really interested. But he still was interested in exploring, okay, what the relationship with someone who deals with subjects I have no idea about can look like. So he agrees to participate with the condition that he's not committing himself to anything specific. At the same time, he meets um, young artist and recent psychology graduate, Rob, um, James Turrell. That's the guy with the curly hair. Um, he invites him to participate because of his um, psychological experimental background. And the third guy in this picture is Dr. Edwards who at that time had no interest in art whatsoever. He just got a call from the PR department of Guard Corporation where he worked on NASA project. Guard Corporation specialized in building livable capsules, first for naval and military and then for space industry. Um, he was, he, yes he was, he died. Um, an experimental psychologist who specialized in conditions that need to be built to create habitable, livable environment. And at that particular time, he was very busy with the moon landing program as well. So he really didn't have a time, but he got a call and he agreed to meet these people. Uh, that ended up to be a lifelong friendship. 
they called it the law firm from the first sight. So there was a roller coaster of ideas and developments in that project that I'm skipping entirely. Uh, at some point, um, Dr. Wirtz gets a commission from NASA to establish a body of knowledge about habitability. What does it mean to build a habitable environment? What spheres of knowledge, what areas of knowledge would have to be included in that? He invites the two artists to participate in initial meetings about that. And what artists learn in those meetings that scientists and engineers treat the problem of habitability as purely technological. How much water does the human need? Um, how much air? How much um, food? How much shaving cream, obviously? <laughs> which, which woman will go there? Um, but there is no room for subjective experience. There is no room in the, in this, in the discussion for anything else that is essential for human life. About the same time, after the first meeting, actually, Terrell quits the collaboration, and nobody knows, there's no documentation of why that happens. And Irvin continues alone, and he and Dr. Wirtz decide to host the symposium and establish two principles for that symposium. First, they want to attract as many bodies of knowledge as possible that relate to habitability. Um, that ended up being psychology, urban planning, pharmaceutics, um, novel industries, obviously space science, um, education as well. And the second principle, and that's the reason I'm having this talk, is they wanted to create a symposium that embodies in its conditions the subject of the symposium itself. They said, okay, in order to really understand what habitability is, people need to become conscious of their habitable environments. And that doesn't work. And so Robert Ehrman decides to host the symposium in the only place he has a full control of, which is his own artist studio. So what you saw in the movie is scientists arriving from the downtown LA. Uh, they disembark um, at the beginning of this particular alley. Went down the alley. Um, Venice, LA was a pretty ran down area at the time. Um, junkies, homeless. Uh, beach people, you name it, and artists, obviously. Uh, so they go down this alley, they enter the space through a hole in a wall that Irvin made for this particular purpose. <laughs> Passing by the rubble left from that operation, enter a rather grim and um, dim space that almost doesn't have any color in it except of these skylights at the, at the top that were designed by Larry Bell, who was already experimenting with colored glass. And the red chairs, which were the idea of his other uh, neighbor, Frank Gehry, the architect. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so they have the panels in these beach chairs. The idea behind them was, OK, it shouldn't be comfortable for the panelists to sit <laughs> so they can really focus on the discussion. Uh, about the same idea went into making people sit on the floor. Um, although on the floor, they actually can lie down, and many people did. <laughs> on the second day, they arrived to the same place, through the same path, but these white columns, I go back and forth, were gone. And that white, big white screen is actually a very thin film that separates between the studio and the, and the street. So the light from the street and the noises of the street entered the studio, but they still couldn't see anything. And obviously they had to change the way they talk to adapt to the new acoustics. And on the third day, that thing went all together. <laughs> and uh, the studio became completely open to the studio. People could walk in and out as they wish. Apart from that space, there were three other spaces that I couldn't find any documentation of that were dedicated to afternoon discussions, group discussions. And one was designed by Robert Irvin, and it didn't have any edges. It was completely white with very uniform, very strong light, and people actually didn't have anything else to look at and to fix the gaze on except the people they speak with. Um, two other spaces by Larry Bell were even worse in a sense. Uh, one had completely impossible acoustics. And remember, Larry Bell was, is uh, almost deaf. Uh, impossible acoustics for people to speak in. 
Um, so they had to get like really close and speak softly. Other space was painted black and had one bare incandescent bulb in the middle. And many people considered all these three overly impress oppressive and they just left and took charge of their conditions. And when you think about art of Robert Ehrman and Larry Bell, you don't think about the word oppressive essentially. <laughs> so they went to the beach, they went to the grass, and they held their sessions outside. They had their lunches on the curb. <laughs> and on the fourth day, to have the conclusions of the whole thing, they went back to the Intercontinental <laughs> Hotel in downtown LA. <laughs> And there is a lot of the interesting question of, okay, what effect did it have? And what I can learn is only what I can see in the proceedings of the, um, of the symposium. Uh, but I skip that, actually, and go to this particular quote from these proceedings. If the issues of the symposium do not attract the attention of the political participants, we should not expect that political decisions um, will weigh, on, uh, weigh habitability criteria. Instead, the result will be more of what many of us seem to be alarmed and critical about our respective urban environments. And that talks about, as I see it, like two options of being critical. Um, one is you express your criticality, and second is you go beyond being critical and actually act on that criticism and engage with the system you want to change. And by the end of that symposium, I believe Irvin was up to his neck in engaging politically with the NASA discourse. And I can draw a really direct line. It's, I never saw this line happening in any literature I read, but I can draw that line between, between what he did with NASA and, for example, contemporary examples of uh, socially engaged art like that piece by Tani Bruguera when he read The Origins of Totalitarianism for 100 Hours in Havana. And the engagement of Tanya with the political system in Cuba and Irvin with discourse in NASA is, in my mind, of the same order. But there is a significant difference, significant difference because Irvin's engagement is with politics of knowledge <coughs> production. And this is why it makes it relevant for me specifically. Uh, this is a building I work in, talking about uh, Frank Gehry. And when I think about agency of rooms, agency of spaces, I think about particular rooms in that building. And the question I ask is, how can I learn from that art history and project that knowledge into the future of this particular institution? Or more specifically, if I want things like that to happen in this museum and in this university, it's a university museum, um, how should I go about doing that? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much for those three really fascinating and very different uh, papers. Um, I'm going to kind of uh, attempt to kick off a uh, discussion uh, with a question of my own um, that perhaps selfishly relates a little bit to the philosophy chamber exhibition upstairs as well. <laughs> Um, so when we were uh, working on the Philosophy Chamber exhibition, we found really um, a lot of extensive records of what arrived in the collection and when, uh, but, a, but um, really uh, re found very limited viewer and user accounts, especially from those outside the room's intended audience of privileged white males. Um, so for example, we know that a delegation of Illinois Wabash chiefs visited uh, the Philosophy Chamber space excuse me, in 1794, but we can really only imagine uh, what uh, their reaction to that space might have been, and especially its display, for example, of indigenous material. Um, so my question for you all, and, and many, some of you have already addressed this a little bit in different ways, but what are the challenges you faced um, in your own research in reconstructing uh, the subjective experience of these spaces, most of which um, no longer exist or don't exist in the way that they did um, in the time periods that you talk about? Especially, it, it seems, um, when uh, these subjective experiences um, go beyond or perhaps even contradict uh, their uh, intended, <laughs> intended um, uh, uh, yeah, the curator's or organizer's intention. So whoever wants to start. <laughs> I mean, I think, Jennifer, your talk illustrates so well how the element of subversion that can be inserted um, in my particular case, uh, 
you, uh, reception or what articles you know um, were written about uh, viewer experiences. Inevitably, I'm sure, like the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia, um, it was about uh, exotica, mm -hmm. just uh, weirdness, um, the opportunity to see the insides of bodies, which wouldn't have necessarily been available to audiences in the 19th century. So I think there was somewhat of a prurient and kind of um, completely transgressive approach, but finding that in the historical documentation is probably almost impossible. Mm -hmm. um, I think literature, you know, triangulating, and I think this is what we all do in certain ways with this kinds of subject matter to find agency, is to triangulate um, and inter kind of connect all kinds of different uh, media and material to kind of tease out, and it's a puzzle. Mm -hmm. But I was struck with your paper too, the, the personal reaction of people who have this experience of recognizing parts of their body that have been mounted in a museum versus the sort of nationalist narrative of reuniting broken bodies. I mean, it seems like the guy who goes and says like, that's my leg, that's a very different reaction than the curators probably intend, right? Like it, it's this personal engagement with the object that they, I think, are looking for a much more transcendent sort of sacrifice um, in some ways. In some ways, but I, some, I, I wonder in reading about how the museum was put together and what the curators were, were thinking of doing, that I'm not actually sure they, they had such a conscious, oh, okay. that, that it was almost an emotional response that in a way allowed for this variation of approach. Because it is striking when you read about um, the visitors. And I mean, Stick, um, Sickles is a crazy sort of character who, uh, not, not to mention his political graft, he had a murder indictment against him. I mean, he was a very colorful <laughs> character. But th this idea of a personal level of somehow a connection to sacrifice and what that word, I mean, I think one has to really think about the Civil War as the, as the nation's traumatic war and to what it meant to, to give up your physical body um, in a way that perhaps was more, more profound than what had happened with uh, the, the American Revolution. Because hmm. um, it almost seems like the curators of um, that museum had this very scientific uh, uh, outcome that they were expecting too, that this would help. To could, yeah. But it, the public kind of turned it into a much more <laughs> emotional and personal experience. Yes. And I think the very sighting of the museum in Lincoln's, yeah. the site of Lincoln's assassination, just suggests the profound a kind of emotional trauma at all fronts, no matter how much of an attempt there was um, by science to reassert a sense of order and containment. Mm -hmm. And Boris, you're lucky in that you have video too. So, <laughs> so we could actually kind of start yeah. to get a sense of the uh, discomfort of participants in that symposium. Yeah, but I, I would like to add to this discussion and share exp my very recent experience mm -hmm. uh, when I went to a gallery in Minneapolis that held a panel of artists of color mm -hmm. uh, about their experience of engaging with museums mm -hmm. in town. And what happened in the process, it was less of a panel and more of an outburst of anger. Uh, but what I found myself like in transformation in the process from person who just was curious and came there uh, to representative of a white space, I didn't know that such term exists, but it does. Um, and one of the woman, women on a, on a panel, um, she said something like, you know, white people just need to learn how to collaborate. And I'm a curator of collaboration. She didn't know I'm in the audience. <laughs> um, and that, yeah, that put a completely different perspective of what collaboration is and what it is about in the museum space. And on subjective experience, yes, there are people who live next to me and they come to my museum and have completely different subjective experience of it mm -hmm. because of their cultural background. And since I'm a museum, I have to account for that. Mm -hmm. So how are you? Do you loaded question, but how are you thinking? Are you thinking of ways to kind of to build that collaboration at your own institution? Do you have some ideas? For that? Very slowly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just very, very slowly. It's an ongoing project. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me let us open up for questions to the audience. We have microphones here. Thank you. Um, 
totally fascinating. Julia, I'd like to ask, um, since you've almost touched on this, uh, with the best will in the world, what we saw can only have been a tiny proportion of the bits of <laughs> dry bones brought yes. back and prepared. What happened to the rest, in a sense, and in, within those spaces, is there, is there any form of taxonomy you can determine? Is there any arrangement that might even hint at some scientific process? And is there any hint at all of use of the collections beyond what's in the, in the case? There, there, there definitely is. And I should put in a plug, because the uh, Army Medical Museum has been in continuous existence since 1862, has changed its name, but is currently uh, known as National Health Medicine, which is uh, available to all American, to all, to any, any um, in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, they built the new facility. So it is a functioning museum, and all of this material is there. You, too, can go and see Sickle's leg, <laughs> which is marked there, as well as actually it also has uh, bits of Abraham here, bone, some bullet went through. It's really, it has, has something for everyone. Um, <laughs> and so that material is still there. I think probably to answer your question in terms of the most um, focused uh, scientific and educative material, that was th this massive um, six volume uh, the uh, surgical and medical history of the War of the Rebellion, where uh, the Army Medical Museum employed um, artists, engravers, photographers, who, so, so that volume is heavily illustrated with much of the material. And all of the material that was collected is still in, is still possessed by the museum. M much of it displayed, but then also in storage. Um, but I would say, the, the Harvard, I believe, has a copy of the volume. Um, or the volumes, and it, it does make for a fascinating account of this process of learning what happens to the body under extreme physical trauma. I mean, there was a there was a, a, a lot of surgical information that came out of war. I mean, I, th I think that's not unusual to the Civil War. It's typical, of, unfortunately, of wars. Could I just follow that up? Yes. Because it just occurred to me that the dates of all of this that you're describing absolutely correspond with Junot's account of the Battle of Solferino and the foundation of the International Red Cross, which comes out of exactly the same yeah, yeah. thing. And, and the United States government, I think, was also inspired by what Britain had been doing with the Crimean War. So they, in the 1850s, they had started publishing medical uh, treatises and throughout, you know, after, after um, the Civil War, the, the uh, war in the Philippines, the uh, U.S. Army, because it is still, uh, it is still part of the, war the Army and the War Department of the United States government, um, it has continued. So through yellow fever, through typhoid, um, it went from really outside of the body to more to germ um, and, and virus by the t um, early 20th century. Is, is what they uh, have continued to do. And they, it's part of Walter Reed, if that name is more uh, familiar. Thank you. Uh, hi, I was um, struck by this sort of interplay between the rooms that you talk about with the, the white women who own slaves and have pictures of their ancestors on the wall, and then the same women later, you know, <laughs> satirically decorating their homes with the bones of the people trying to take those homes away. They, you know, um, if you could talk about the interplay of that and of the the white Southern women and their domestic spheres and how that related to the violence of the men around them mm -hmm. and how that affected the yeah the living in those spaces. That's a fascinating connection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, and I, I mean, I think the thing with slavery, right, is the sort of violence that, I, I was struck by the, the violence that's obvious with Julia's paper um, and the way that the violence of slavery is sometimes not made visible um, in the same way. And so it, the sort of um, 
the, the spectral uh, skeletal presence of those bodies, I mean, in many ways, I think it's, is also tapping into this notion of sort of Southerners as kind of barbaric people who already are committing acts of violence against enslaved bodies, um, and therefore it seems are potentially more able to kind of um, misuse bodies of, of Union soldiers, right? I mean, I feel like slavery was kind of haunting those, that assumption as well. Um, but it's interesting, too, because there's also an active agency in the curating of those women's, southern Confederate women's homes in, a, in asserting a kind of power or authority over the men who are destroying perhaps their way of life. So mm -hmm. there, there's a, an aspect of resistance and subversion in the way they're using these choosing to use these bones. Although it strikes me, now that I think about it, because all of, so, so a lot of my evidence is coming from these white planters who are you know, writing down how they're trying to save their paintings or how they're trying to hide their paintings or the things that they perceive as horrible that happened to their paintings during the war, but it is always a male voice. Um, so now that you're asking that question in terms of gendered control of the household, I hadn't really thought about why it's always that male voice that's kind of talking about what they're doing with these painting collections. Um, I'll have to think more about that. Yeah, thank you. There's also an interesting correspondence with iconoclasm, I think, right? yeah. With, yeah. with the element of destruction, whether the representations of figures or the actual, the actual figures. figures themselves where you've disarticulated skeletons and then remove them to this new environment. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for three great papers. Um, I have a comment and a question, um, particularly for um, Jennifer and Julia's papers. <coughs> I couldn't help but, as I was listening to your papers, think obviously about different kinds of trauma and think about these spaces of trauma and how these objects trace some of those histories, in some cases very directly in terms of the physical trauma, but also the emotional and physical trauma of slavery. And I was wondering, as you're thinking about these spaces, could you imagine um, contemporary museum reinterpretations of these objects that could be trauma-informed or in becomes therapeutic spaces? Could Wilton House be reinterpreted <laughs> as a space, thinking about that history? I mean, right. the curator there's pretty cool. He might be game. It's awfully cool. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just sort of thinking about some of those um, possibilities because that history is so present in these objects, and how can we as curators and scholars think about these histories of trauma to try to do some of that work today in our spaces? Yeah, so I mean, there's some really wonderful contemporary artists who are, who are doing kind of um, takes on iconoclasm, right? So Titus Kafar's work comes to mind kind of immediately as somebody who's, um, you know, taking images and um, images of white, you know, creating new pseudo-historical images of white elites, um, but, but using interesting modes of destruction on those canvases to kind of get at um, subversive possibilities of how they could have been viewed. Um, so there's kind of a direct relationship with where contemporary artists are working right now. Um, but yeah, I think, I think this gets back to sort of the problem of interpretation in Southern plantation spaces, which um, as many scholars have pointed out, uh, remains really resistant to talking about the realities of slavery, but particularly within the kind of sacrosanct mansion house, right? So um, whereas slavery may be discussed in outbuildings or in other spaces outside of the the plantation parlor, um, the parlor becomes reserved as the space to just really celebrate, you know, white elite consumption of goods. Um, so I think I think there's definitely a possibility, um, and I and I feel like one of the interpretive challenges is it all has to happen kind of outside of the object, right? Because the object, you know, if you're, you're having a subversive reading, then it has to happen in a way that implicates the object but doesn't directly impact the object, right? Um, but yeah, I would love. I would love to see what we do this. <laughs> I think it speaks a little bit to Boris's um, question yeah, too, yeah. Or, or comment too, um, is that perhaps there needs to be a place of discomfort. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, you can see in the Army Medical Museum an attempt to streamline that. Robert Irwin seemed to like, open up. To celebrate that, <laughs> like, yeah. To absolutely <laughs> like, let it go. And perhaps there's a better place that we need to kind of carve out where we can sit with some of these contradictions. I mean, I think Titus Kafar's work does that in a really powerful way by forcing us to reimagine what we're looking at and disrupt these kinds of narratives. But it's not an easy move to make because that kind of slippage 
always feels, I think, it feels like a loss of control, <laughs> which you have to be ready to embrace. I think we'll, we'll take one more question. Um, I think Lewis has a, perhaps a follow-up. I, I, I do. I'm going to claim the stage for a second. <laughs> um, I want to pick up actually right where you just left off, and that is with disruption. Uh, it seems to me that disruption is a really interesting theme that ties all three of your papers together. And um, I teach in a school of architecture where uh, disruption, if it ever happens, is always from the, the, the generators, the designers' perspective, right? So disruption is intentional design disruption. Uh, and I think we as scholars and curators um, have an incredibly important responsibility to create the platform by which external disruption can happen. And I wonder if you would muse on that for just a minute as practitioners of our disciplines. What is our responsibility to catalyze an external disruption and actually observe and report and then analyze that as part of the scholarly process? It's a huge challenge. <laughs> I can begin? Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a little bit connected to the whole discussion of measurable outcomes. OK, I do something, I see what it does, and I correct. And the question that comes more often, uh, most often when I talk about that event was, OK, did it actually change NASA discourse? And my answer is that it's not really interesting whether it changed or not, because one singular event cannot really change a huge sort of political system of relationships. And the better question is, I think, not how we measure the impact of those events or how we learn them, but how to construct a sustainable kind of platform for such interferences to happen all the time, continuously. And then over time, we learn and correct that system as we go. Um, there are a lot of projects of artists in universities happening. Almost exclusively these projects are fixed term. They begin and they end and they go. And then so the question of whether the disruption actually happened or do what did it do, you can't really talk about that. University is a very complex and very huge system. One event will not change it. Perhaps there has to be a bit of faith in long-term outcomes that, I mean, it goes against the bibliometric system that's in place in Britain, I think to some degree in the United States as well, um, that, you, that, you, that it's all measurable. I think as educators, most of us know the moment of real meaningfulness is when a student comes back after 10, 15, 20 years and says, you know, remember, I took a course with you and, you know, this thing that you never thought was meaningful or you don't even remember, did something that set them on a trajectory. That's, the, that's, that's, I think, the investment one has to make in that kind of possibility, that you open up those spaces for possibility and are comfortable with when perhaps those things don't happen, but you believe it's worth it for the long term. But I think that is part of the danger. The, the, tempor the temporary fix, I think, is part of the danger of the disruption, right? That, to disrupt is to fundamentally kind of alleviate some stress and then go back to things as they were, right? Whereas I think ultimately what we want to see is systemic change. Um, and so I, I do fear that by making ourselves feel better by telling these stories about agency that in some ways all we do is kind of put a positive spin on a very difficult thing that doesn't mm -hmm. fundamentally change. And then go back thing. to business as usual. And then go back to, right, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. <laughs> Back to business as usual. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're going to have a, a short break and reconvene at 11.30 for the next panel. So we'll see you all then. Thanks, thanks again to our speakers. Thank you.